Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and so today I want to talk about Hochschild cohomology for two uh, types of varieties. And uh, for one of these, for the partial flag varieties, G mod P is my notation for a partial flag variety. I will recall what this notation really means uh, once we get there. Uh, this is joint work with Maxim Smirnov, and this is available on the archive. And for final triples, uh, and this is why I'm, I'm speaking about this topic, because I know that uh, people in Nottingham have a more than average interest in final trifles and final varieties. Uh, this is joint work with Enrico Fatigenti and Fabio Tanturi. This is work in progress. Um, no promises on when this will be on the archive, but we are uh, slowly making progress in finishing everything and writing everything up. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the, what is going to be the structure of the talk? Well, there are going to be three parts in the talk, and this is really just three parts in the title. So uh, part one is just Hochschild cohomology. I will recall uh, what this is because I imagine that this is not standard knowledge for the average working algebraic geometer. Um, and then we will describe what Hochschild cohomology has to say or what it is for partial flag varieties uh, and for final trifolds. And so for final trifolds, this is in some sense a follow-up talk of the talk that Enrico gave a few weeks ago in the same seminar. So if you remember what he talked about, uh, that will be an important ingredient in our approach. Um, okay, so let me recall what is uh, Hochschild cohomology. So throughout, we're going to be fixing a field of characteristic zero. Um, and then in the history starts quite early where Hochschild uh, defined in 1945 uh, for associative algebras, so we let A be an associative K algebra. Uh, there's no need for commutativity. Uh, he defined roughly Hochschild cohomology, or one can identify Hochschild cohomology with um, an extension group. Uh, and what we do is we consider A as an A by module. Uh, and so an A by module. Oh, I tend to use blue for what I write during the talk, so I should stick to that convention. Um, so we consider A as an A by module, and that's the same as a left uh, A tensor A op module. So we can just write down these extension groups. This at this point just a uh, K vector space. And that is all the structure we are given for now. Um, and you can now start uh, developing the story in different directions. The first direction I want to mention is the Hochschild Kostan Rosenberg decomposition. Uh, so this is a result from uh, 17 years later, if my mental arithmetic is not too far off. And this gives a geometric description. So we have a vector space, but in good situations, we can actually give a geometric description. But for this to make any sense, to have any type of geometry, we need that the algebra A is actually commutative, and uh, we want it to be a regular algebra. And uh, in that case, we have the following isomorphism. We have the tangent bundle on A, and we can take exterior powers of this tangent bundle. This is a, a projective module. Uh, and we have the following isomorphism. So we get a link to algebraic geometry. Um, and the majority of the talk is about Hochschild cohomology. Um, but I should, and I want to make a parallel uh, to Hochschild homology. And these two ingredients, so the definition and this geometric identification, they uh, become the following. So the definition now involves the Tor functor. So instead of taking the derived functors of the home, uh, we take derived uh, functors of the tensor product inside this category of bimodules. And uh, the geometric identification now does not use um, the tangent bundle, but it uses the cotangent bundle. Um, and this will be useful once we start talking uh, about what kind of interpretation or how we want to encode uh, what we were trying to compute. OK, and we've now talked about the definition and a geometric interpretation, but 
why is Hochschild cohomology such an interesting invariant? Well, there are two reasons, uh, and they're uh, related to each other. And uh, the first one is that uh, in 1963, Gersten Haber uh, showed that there is an extremely rich algebraic structure on these vector spaces. So these are not just great vector spaces or greatest vector space if we decide to sum them together. No, there is really lots and lots of algebraic structure on them. And the first one is, oh, I say associative product, but it's even a commutative product. And I should really say graded commutative product. Um, but it is also associative. Uh, otherwise, I should not be calling it a product, I guess. And uh, so what we did is we combined all of these spaces together. So we take a direct sum. And on this direct sum, we have a product. And this product has a certain degree, and the degree is 0. So if we take something in degrees uh, 15 and 12, or oh, shouldn't use large numbers, because then 3 and 4, um, then if you multiply these two elements together, we get something in degree 7. And the second algebraic structure there exists on uh, this uh, graded vector space is a Lie bracket, and this Lie bracket has degree minus 1. So if we take something in degree 3, and degree four, uh, we end up in degree six. Not in degree seven, but in degree six. And this already tells us that uh, if we take something in degree one and something in degree one, we again end up in degree one. So we have a Lie bracket on the first Hochschild cohomology. And in particular, we get a Lie subalgebra. Not a graded Lie algebra, but just a Lie subalgebra in the usual sense uh, of the word. And uh, I should also mention that this induces a representation structure on every HHI, or maybe I should use N. Because if we take something in degree 1 and something in the degree N, the Lie bracket being of degree minus 1, we end up in degree 1, uh, degree N, sorry. And these two structures are moreover compatible, and in, I'm not going to axiomatize the entire thing. Uh, we don't really need that, but what we get is the structure of a Gersten Haber algebra named after him. And uh, so this is an interesting invariant. You can try to describe this for any algebra uh, that you're given, uh, and maybe you get some interesting algebraic structure there. Maybe it's trivial, maybe it's not trivial. Um, but there is another reason why people are very interested in Hochschild cohomology, and that is deformation theory. And uh, deformation theory in the setup that we are now in, so for an associative algebra, uh, we have that the second Hochschild cohomology classifies uh, first order deformations. And uh, in deformation theory, we're interested in having a tangent space to our deformation problem and also knowing what kind of obstructions there are. And uh, we have this Lie bracket, and my wife is constantly texting me, it seems. Um, we have this Lie bracket of degree minus one. And if we take two elements in degree two, then, well, we take a self bracket of an element in degree two. So we take a class alpha in there, a first order deformation. Then we can look at alpha alpha. Uh, that's a class in uh, HH3, and this measures the obstruction, uh, similar to uh, the usual deformation theory that one has for uh, varieties. And when I say classifies first order deformations, I should say deformations as what? And this is deformations as associative algebra. So even if we start with a commutative algebra and uh, we feed it 
this when we feed it to this Hochschild cohomology machine and we look at the second Hochschild cohomology, then the second Hochschild cohomology will classify first order deformations as an associative algebra, not necessarily respecting the uh, commutativity of the product. Okay. But we want to do algebra geometry, and so far I've only talked about associative algebras. So in the 1980s, um, Gersten Haber and Schack gave a definition of Hochschild cohomology, which worked for quasi projective varieties. It's a very intricate uh, definition. Um, and I'm not going to give I'm not going to give that definition. Rather, I will give a definition uh, which was given by Kontsevich, inspired by the first definition that we gave. Namely, if we think about what does it mean geometrically to look at extensions of A as an A by module, well, we are looking at extensions of uh, the diagonal on the product x times x. And so, let's just define Hochschild cohomology of a quasi-projective variety as this extension group, very similar to how we did it before, then we're looking for, again, this geometric uh, identification. Uh, and so this is the Hochschild constant Rosenberg decomposition mentioned before. And we again see the tangent bundle appearing, but we're now no longer on an affine variety. Therefore, the tangent bundle and its exterior powers could acquire uh, some cohomology. And uh, we're looking at the direct sum of all cohomologies uh, of the exterior squares of the tangent bundle, such that the sum of the degree of cohomology and the power is equal to n. So in the affine case, we just recover what I mentioned on the first page. And again, one can show, so I'm sweeping lots and lots of details under the rug here, um, that there is this rich algebraic structure on these vector spaces. So in particular, if we take a uh, smooth projective uh, variety, we get via this identification uh, a graded finite dimensional vector space. Um, and this graded finite dimensional vector space has also a, an algebraic structure coming from the polyvector fields, because that's a name uh, for these things, where because we have sheaf cohomology, we have the cup product in sheaf cohomology. That's going to give us uh, the uh, commutative graded product. And there's also the Schouten bracket, uh, which gives us a Lie bracket uh, on the uh, exterior powers of the tangent bundle. And we get a, even a bi-graded uh, structure combining this product and this Lie bracket. And very interesting, but not so relevant uh, for today's talk, is that there exists this isomorphism, and this isomorphism is not compatible with the algebraic structures. You need a fancy isomorphism to make these two structures compatible, but that is not uh, the purpose of today's talk, uh, although it's a very interesting topic. Rather, um, we want to compute uh, this decomposition and uh, understand why it is interesting to compute this decomposition for smooth projective varieties. And so deformation theory, uh, we're not looking at associative algebras, we're looking at uh, varieties. What happens is that we're looking at deformations of the category of coherent sheaves. This is a theory developed by uh, Lowen and Van den Berg. And if we apply this decomposition, so we have the HKR decomposition, and when we apply it uh, to the degree, the degree two part, uh, we get a decomposition into three terms, where one of these terms is very familiar. This middle term here, that is just the usual first order deformations of X as a variety, the way that uh, we lo love to do algebraic geometry and deformation theory in algebraic geometry. But there's two more terms coming from this uh, HKR decomposition. And um, for us, because we will mostly be interested in Fama varieties, this part here will just vanish. This corresponds to something called Jervy deformation, but it's not important for us right now. The intriguing thing is this part here. 
Um, and this classifies Poisson structures, or to be really precise, I should say, pre-Poisson structures. And this corresponds to non-commutative deformations. And I could go on and on and on about this. So this is a derived invariant. There is this gerson Haber calculus. There is very interesting questions regarding functoriality. But rather, let's say what we want to be doing today because uh, I have been talking for 15 minutes and I have not really said anything about what the goal really is. And so the goal is to just determine these sheaf cohomology spaces for interesting varieties. Um, if you're interested in deformation theory, then one of your goals is to determine this finite dimensional vector space plus some additional structures. Um, well, if we're interested in a more general deformation theory, it becomes interesting to de determine this entire uh, vector space. And we're not just trying to determine uh, these vector spaces, because then it's just a it's a challenging uh, but somewhat silly-ish problem uh, for uh, chief cohomology. We're also interested in this rich algebraic structure and see how much we can say about it. And how do we want to encode um, these vector spaces. So we want to encode these uh, efficiently. And for this reason, I introduced Hochschild homology in the beginning um, because Hochschild homology has a similar HKR decomposition, uh, but instead of using uh, the tangent bundle, we know from the affine situation we have to use the cotangent bundle. And uh, the uh, indexing now is over uh, Q and P. And I, make, I must make sure I don't mess up. We take P minus Q equal to N. And these vector spaces are somewhat more familiar uh, to the average uh, working algebraic geometer because we recognize these coming from the Hodge decomposition. Um, so the Hodge decomposition, let's say that we're currently working over uh, the complex numbers. Um, this gives a decomposition of the nth uh, cohomology, singular cohomology of our variety, seen as a complex manifold, um, where we sum over n equal to p plus q. And these dimensions are often conveniently encoded in the Hodge diamond. So here we see a picture of what the Hodge diamond is. So the dimension HPQ, so HPQ is the dimension of this thing. And uh, we can put this in a big table and this table is organized in the diamond shape um, because there are interesting symmetries. So there are two symmetries in this table. There is the Hodge symmetry and the Serre symmetry. And the Hodge symmetry just tells us that there is a symmetry along the vertical axis, that this number is equal to that number, and that this number is equal to that number, etc. And the Serre symmetry tells us that this number is equal to that number. And so we're now mirroring through the point. And the Hodge decomposition tells us that the zero cohomology, the dimension of this is uh, given by this row, and the first cohomology, uh, the dimension of that thing is given by that row, et cetera, et cetera. And then for Hochschild homology, we have to do everything uh, column per column. Um, and so this just gives us the dimension of Hochschild homology. And this is a familiar story, um, and there really exists an industry uh, to compute these Hodge numbers. It is an interesting question to compute Hodge numbers for many varieties, because this tells us it's a very concrete invariant that can be used to distinguish uh, varieties, and it's a good challenge to really understand varieties. If we can compute the Hodge numbers, we can, to some extent, say that we understand varieties. So. Now, if we change focus to Hochschild cohomology, uh, let's use the letter G instead of the letter H, and uh, we define uh, GPQ as the dimension of this space that we are uh, interested in, if we care about Hochschild cohomology. 
And I propose to organize this into a parallelogram because we should not uh, have too much symmetry because symmetry does not hold uh, for Oxford cohomology. And, uh, oh, the picture is slightly too big. So what we get is the following uh, visualization where the zero of Hochschild homology, cohomology, sorry, uh, there's just a single sum end, uh, the global sections of the structure sheaf, and uh, we put that there. So this is, I should say this maybe, this is the cohomology of the structure sheaf. Here we take the cohomology of the tangent bundle, cohomology of the second exterior power of the tangent bundle, and we are very interested in these low degree parts now. And uh, we already recognize or introduce some of these uh, spaces. So this part here, that's the familiar Kodaira Spencer deformation theory. Uh, that's the tangent space to the deformation problem. Um, we have these Poisson structures living in this part of the parallelogram. And uh, this number here, is the first cohomology of the structure sheet that is just a Lie algebra to the Picard uh, variety, which is an abelian variety. And here we take a Lie algebra at the automorphism group. And so this is somewhat less familiar. Um, and the important thing is now that there are no symmetries, that can make our life a little bit uh, troublesome. We can't just say, oh, we've computed this, so therefore we've computed that. Um, but there is this link to deformation theory, making it particularly interesting to a certain type of uh, algebraic geometer, of which I am uh, one, I guess. And what's also important is that if X is Fano, then roughly half, um, and the roughly half is the lower diagonal part, vanishes. Uh, and this comes from uh, Kodaira Nakano vanishing. So for final varieties, one gets a little bit more pleasant. We don't have to compute everything. So all the green boxes, they're already uh, zero and we can just ignore them. Okay, so I've been talking for 20-ish uh, minutes. Let's now start talking about the two objects that we're interested in, namely partial flag varieties and uh, final triples. And let's start with uh, partial flag varieties, unless a riot breaks out and everyone in the audience uh, asks me to start with uh, the final trifles. Um, so the setup here, what's the notation going to be? Um, G is a reductive algebraic group. And in, I prefer to just take a simple algebraic group, but usually uh, People think about GLN as their favorite uh, reductive algebraic group, and that one is not quite simple. So the example to keep in mind is GLN. And inside GLN, we have the Borel subgroup, that is the subgroup of upper triangular matrices. And the nice thing about the quotient of G mod B so the quotient G mod B, so the quotient by the Borel is projective. There's no reason why a quotient uh, of a reductive algebraic group is projective, but if uh, we take the quotient by the Borel, we get a projective variety, and therefore all the invariants that we're interested in computing will be finite dimensional, and therefore the whole procedure makes sense. And we will also be mostly interested in taking an intermediate group, um, and so any group containing the Borel subgroup is called the, a parabolic subgroup. And here, the, the main example for GLN is the following uh, subgroup where we look at upper triangular block matrices uh, of size K and N minus K. And the nice thing now is that this uh, G mod P, this quotient is not just a projective variety, it is a smooth projective variety and it's a final variety. And the common thing with uh, partial flag varieties is that one wants to use representation theory, if we started with very representation theoretical objects, we started with some reductive groups and some uh, subgroups of that. So we are interested in using representation theory. My co-author is telling me something. I hope we didn't find a mistake in our paper all of a sudden. Um, 
so we want to use representation theory of these two groups to determine invariance of the variety G mod P. So as an algebraic geometry, we're interested in, in these quotients, but we can use representation theory of the defining groups to do this. And so what is the classification of these G mod P's? They're, they come in a very discrete classification, uh, unlike final trefolds. Um, and the classification is that such a quotient G mod P is classified by giving a drinking diagram. That is just a very particular uh, graph together with a subset of the vertices. Um, and so I've, get, I've already drawn, you see on the screen, some, some linking diagrams. Um, but the subsets that we will be mostly interested in are the singletons. Um, because those will correspond to maximal parabolics. Whereas the Borel subgroup is the minimal parabolic. And so that would correspond to giving, to, to choosing all uh, vertices in the, uh, in the graph. Um, and so these are called generalized Grismanians. So if you look at the paper with Maxim, the title of that paper contains the word generalized Grismanians for this particular reason. And so I've given here um, uh, three thinking diagrams, one of type AN, one of type BN, and one of type DN. And I've already chosen uh, a singleton uh, inside all of these graphs. And the G mod P that we get from choosing this thinking diagram and this uh, vertex, for the first example, this is PN plus one. So that is indeed a smooth projective final variety. No news there. Um, if we do the same thing with the AN uh, thinking diagram, where we choose somewhere in the middle at position K, we get the Grismanian KN. And uh, if we do something for uh, type B, we get a quadric, an odd dimensional quadric. Oh, this should be a minus one. And this is the even dimensional quadric. And so these are some very easy down to earth examples, but for every thinking diagram uh, and every choice of a vertex, we get an interesting smooth projective uh, palm of variety. And the Hochschild homology of these things, not that they phrased it in that language, but this was computed all the way back in the 1950s by Borel in Histebruch. And this was really the start of the idea uh, of using representation theory uh, to do geometry. And what are the important conclusions? So I mentioned that these Hodge numbers you encode them into a Hodge diamond. Well, many of these numbers will be zero for these uh, uh, partial flag varieties, um, namely outside the diagonal, so outside this uh, vertical uh, diagonal, they will be zero. And the numbers on the diagonal, they can be easily computed um, if you have some representation theory under your belt uh, using uh, elements in the wild group. So there are two wild groups. There's a wild group of G, there's the wild group of the parabolic subgroup, and the interplay between uh, these two, one is a subgroup of the other, can be used to determine these Hodge numbers. So this is how representation theory can be used to help in determining uh, geometric or topological invariance. And so now we have to switch to Hochschild cohomology of these things, um, because that's what we wanted to compute. And um, a folklore belief um, held by, by some experts was that something similar should be happening. Uh, namely, that uh, this piece of the HKR decomposition is zero for all P at least one. So there's no symmetry as we had before. Um, but based on examples uh, that people computed, namely Grismanians and Quadrics mostly, um, but also some G mod Bs, so for the Borel subgroup, uh, people believed that there should be this vanishing property. And we could call this uh, Hochschild affine, 
because there is no higher cohomology of uh, exterior powers of tangent bundle. So this is a convenient way of saying, oh, to have this property is say that something is Hochschild affine. So that will be the terminology I use. So like I mentioned, you can, it's a fun exercise to compute this for Grismanians and quadrates. Um, and parallel to this story, uh, it also makes sense to look at symmetric powers of the tangent bundle, uh, because exterior powers are just an odd version uh, of uh, symmetric powers. And there it is indeed true that uh, all higher cohomology of the symmetric powers vanishes. Um, and so based on this belief, people even wrote in preprints that this property holds. Um, but I was very intrigued by this, and uh, I started playing around with this problem together with Maxim. And uh, you quickly hit a, a roadblock if uh, you start playing around with this problem, because the tangent bundle and the exterior powers, they are equivariant vector bundles. So because they are equivariant vector bundles, these representation theoretical methods make sense. But for these methods to work uh, in a good way, you need them to be what is called completely reducible. And if a vector bundle is completely reducible, so here this one is now completely reducible, then the borel weil bob theorem, for which you don't need the statement, uh, it would only distract uh, if you've never seen it before, uh, and if you have seen it before, it would be quite boring, um, gives us a way of computing the sheaf cohomology. So there's a rich source of vector bundles on these smooth projective Fano varieties, so that is good news. So we like to construct as many uh, objects uh, in the category as possible. Um, and Borel while Bob gives us a method to compute sheaf cohomology, and that's precisely what we want to do. We want to compute sheaf cohomology. But this only works for highest weights coming from the Levy subgroup or quotient. And so this is a subgroup of the uh, parabolic subgroup that we fixed. And what is now important is that equivariant vector bundles, so this is the category of equivariant vector bundles, is equivalent to the category of representations of P. So this is one bridge between representation to your algebraic geometry. Um, but P is not semi-simple. So this is a very complicated category. Um, and inside there, we have uh, a smaller category. And that thing is a semi-simple category. And it's this category which gives rise to these completely reducible vector bundles. And so what I'm saying here is that Often, Px and wedge Qtx, they live on this top row and not on this bottom row. And the evidence that people computed usually was uh, for uh, cases where it happened to live on the bottom row. Sometimes by accident or by good geometric properties, you get you end up in this easier situation. And so this whole borel wild bot machinery is not necessarily applicable. Um, and then, so we have this question about vanishing and implicit in a paper from uh, Kono uh, from 91, uh, he showed that if G mod P is what is called co-minuscule or adjoint or co-adjoint, I will say in a second uh, what these uh, words mean, then, uh, this Hochschild cohomology is Hochschild affine. So for a class of uh, partial flag varieties, or generalized Grismanians, in fact, um, we have this folklore conjecture uh, to be true. And once you have this vanishing, you can try to describe uh, the global sections. And uh, so in this joint work with Maxim, we did for the co minuscule and the adjoint case, we described uh, what this Hochschild cohomology is, um, not just as a vector space, so we don't just give the dimension, we really say what it is as a representation of HH1 of G mod P. So this is a, a Lie algebra. And which Lie algebra is this? Well, 
This is actually, and now I have to disappoint all the Germans, I can't write Fraktur, even though I have been in Bonn for uh, almost four years. So this is just a Lie algebra of G. So this is good news because now we have a very convenient description, uh, and in particular of the dimension uh, of uh, all the Hochschild cohomology spaces. And so I should say what co minuscule adjoint and co-adjoint means. And so these are three adjectives uh, you can say or can attach to a uh, G mod P. These are adjectives for a partial flag variety. Um, and here there is a table where I just collected all the thinking diagrams. And uh, so I should maybe say what this means. So this here, this Grismanium here, corresponds to specifying the fourth vertex uh, over there. Uh, and if we say this orthogonal Grismanian, that is the third vertex uh, of this B5 thinking diagram. And so the copinous pool ones are all the ones in blue. The adjoint ones are all the ones in red. And the green ones are all the co-adjoint ones. And so in particular for all of these, uh, one can check that there is this vanishing property. and we have a full description, at least in the first two cases. Um, now I should mention that already for the co-adjoint case, we don't have a good uniform description in our paper. Uh, we can compute it uh, with computer algebra techniques, and one can try to come up with a conjecture, but there's not really a good um, description yet, a very convenient description. So in the paper, we give a very uh, careful uh, description of these representations, which one appear, what's the multiplicity of them, um, but the co-adjoint one case is still open. But if you combine uh, these three tables, uh, you will see that there are still many cases missing. So these three adjectives don't cover all of the generalized Grismanians, and this is where the surprise happens, um, namely this non-vanishing that uh, people believed in is wrong. So the folklore belief is wrong, and it's not just wrong, it is as wrong as it can be. It is maximally wrong. That's not really a technical term. Um, but what do I mean by maximally wrong? Well, maybe I should say, put this with a question mark, because I'm now going to phrase a conjecture. Um, and uh, the conjecture is that if P is a maximal parabolic subgroup, such that the quotient is, oh, I should, oh, this is very important, not co minuscule or not co adjoint, so not covered yet by uh, the results mentioned above, then uh, the Hochschild cohomology is not Hochschild affine. And I phrase this as a conjecture um, because we have, don't have a proof for this. It's kind of hard to give a uniform proof that something does not vanish, at least with the methods and techniques that uh, we have been using. But we have lots of computational evidence. So we've computed it for all thinking diagrams up to 10 vertices, except for E8. E8 tends to be... Uh, a problematic case, and it is a problematic case in this case as well. Well, we don't have a full uh, computation for E8. We have some partial computations, which kind of suggest that what we believe is true. And in the paper, we explicitly analyzed one case. Um, so CN mod P2, let's look at the table. Uh, so we are now interested in, uh, oh, oh, I think I said the, I think I wrote the wrong example here. This must be a three then. Uh, so for this case, uh, we checked that the non-vanishing, I think this must be for all n greater than four, um, sorry for being ill-prepared. Uh, we checked in the paper um, that there is this non-vanishing by showing really that oh, for this exterior power, there is non-vanishing, um, but this does not scale to the other cases. It only works for this particular uh, family. Um, so as a challenge to the audience, uh, can you prove this non-vanishing that we believe to hold? Um, 
we don't have the techniques for that right now, uh, but we have this ample computational evidence. Um, and it suggests that there are interesting patterns happening, uh, but we just can't formalize the patterns that are really happening. Um, and so I have now 20 minutes left. Uh, and so this, are there any questions? Because I just have been talking into a void for uh, 40 minutes. Um, and as you can see, I have three pages left. Uh, so there is time for questions if there are any at this point. Okay, everyone is comatose, that's good. Um, so now we can talk about final tree falls. Uh, and before we can talk about final tree falls, you can talk about the puzzle surfaces and then computing um, this uh, parallelogram, uh, which takes on the following easy shape. So here we have the dimension of the automorphism group. Here we have the dimension of H1 of the tangent bundle. Uh, here we have the dimension of H0 of the antimicle. And that's it. So determining these three numbers is for the puzzle surface just a pleasant exercise uh, that you can give someone doing their first algebraic geometry course. Someone is unmuted. David, do we have a question? Seemingly not. Okay. Um, and then we can try to do the same thing for final tree folds. Uh, and so this question is very interesting for one reason, namely, how good is our understanding of final tree falls? So when I say a good test, this is really how good is our understanding? So these things have been classified. Um, and is the, the classification that we have sufficiently strong um, or the description that we have in the classification sufficiently good uh, to do these type of computations. And it's also very interesting uh, from the point of view of classification of Poisson structures. Um, and I will briefly say uh, what Poisson structures are in a second. Rather, let's first talk about Hochschild homology before we talk about Hochschild cohomology. Um, and the Hodge diamond of a uh, final tree fold has a very easy shape. By the symmetry, we know that these two numbers and these two numbers are the same. Uh, and these numbers are rho. So this is the rank of the Picard group. And the other number doesn't really have another interpretation. It's just H12. It's the first. Oh, yeah. And so these numbers are the same, but maybe I should write it as such. So these are the same. Um, and these are just given in the classification. So the way they were classified, final tree falls. So this follows from the classification. Uh, they were used to distinguish different families. And so maybe now is a good time to give a warning. Namely, that um, these HPQ, they are constant in a family but these GPQ, these dimensions that we are interested in, interested in uh, for the purpose of today's talk, they are not necessarily constant. They were in the case of Delpezzo surfaces um, because these automorphism groups, uh, they don't really jump. Uh, so in this way, you see that uh, they are constant. But for final trefolds, it is possible that the automorphism group of a final trefold jumps up in a family. Um, OK, and I should say now uh, something about Poisson structures. So I mentioned that uh, we are interested. So this is a piece of the second Hochschild cohomology of X. We're interested in uh, global sections of uh, the second power of the tangent bundle. 
and not just in global sections. We are interested in those global sections for which the, and this is now the Schout bracket, which itself vanishes. Um, so this is uh, an obstruction uh, living inside the global sections of this, the third exterior power. And in dimension three, there exists a full class, sorry, sorry, in dimension two, there exists a full classification of what are called Poisson surfaces. Not just the Alpezzo surfaces, uh, but any type of surface. They looked at the classification of surfaces and they determined which ones uh, have a non zero uh, H uh, global sections of the anti canonical, so vanishing is for free. So what we're just interested in is surfaces such that H0S of the anti-canonical uh, is non-zero. And there is no need to check this uh, uh, and bracket. So there is no least structure needed because this, the third exterior power of the tangent bundle on the surface just vanishes. Um, so this was classified by Bartocci uh, and Macri. Uh, and now we come to uh, the final threefold case. Um, and in the case of rank one, uh, this was classified by uh, Lore, Pereira, and Touze in 2011. And so we are interested now in H0x wedge 2 tx and then alpha in there. And the obstruction alpha alpha, that one lives in H0x of the anti-canonical the third exterior power of the tangent bundle. And this is very much non-zero for a final variety. Um, so there is no free vanishing of the self bracket. And it, it's actually a, a rather strong condition uh, that this self bracket vanishes. And so one example I want to mention here is um, the case 110. So this is rho is equal to one. Uh, and this is the 10th uh, element in the classification. And uh, the geometric description of this thing is as a section of a vector bundle on a Grismanian. So we have the Grismanian 3.7, that's a 12 dimensional uh, variety. And we have the universal sub bundle, that's a uh, rank 3 bundle. And the third exterior power should be a uh, rank nine bundle, therefore. Um, and so this is going to be a uh, smooth projective final threefold for the generic choice of a section. And there exists a six dimensional family of these. And inside um, this uh, six dimensional family, there exists jumping for. Uh, the dimension of the automorphism group. Um, this is a very interesting one. Uh, this is the first time this really happens for final trefolds. Um, so the dimension really jumps, so generically it's zero, um, but it jumps up to one in a one dimensional family. And then in unique point on this one dimensional family, it jumps all the way to three. Three is not a big number, but it's still non zero. So there is some jumping happening. And Inside this six dimensional family, we can also look at these Poisson vector spaces and or Poisson structures. And what happens is that inside this six dimensional family, there exists a unique element where there exists a unique non zero alpha up to rescaling because everything here is linear um, such that. Alpha alpha. Um, there is no jumping happening for uh, this space. So alpha lives in here. It is always three dimensional, but this vanishing condition is never satisfied except for one alpha on one of these uh, found three folds in the six dimensional family. So that is a very interesting uh, situation. So this is what is in this paper by Lore, Pereira, and Touze, the gave classification. Um, and now, what have we done? 
um, for uh, final three falls. This was only rank one. So they did it for 17. So yeah, I should maybe say this. This is 17 out of 105 families. One could argue that these are the 17 most interesting families, um, but there are other families uh, and uh, we should not ignore them. And I mentioned the vanishing. And so the three vanishing uh, for uh, final three folds tells us that these numbers are automatically zero. So we don't need to determine them. This number here, is part of the classification by uh, Mori and Mukai. So more classification by Mori and Mukai. This is one of the invariants they described and used to distinguish uh, Thano varieties. Um, and then we have this number here, and this is the, should be precise, the dimension of the automorphism group. And this was described recently uh, in 2019 by Chelsov, Pijalkovsky, and Shramov. So we know when these numbers are non-zero. So yeah, the dimension of these things uh, is described in this very interesting paper. And this number here, um, this is some, uh, and so this corresponds roughly to the number of moduli, so how many, elements are there or what's the size of the family uh, in this classification and um, in the paper of Chelsov, Puzlakovsky and Shramov they determined this number of moduli uh, but only for the ones where the dimension of the automorphism group is non-zero so there's still many cases missing um, and uh, Sasha Kuznetsov uh, computed this number of moduli in an email conversation that we had uh, two years ago um, but there's no good proof for this and these numbers here, which are also interesting uh, if you care about Poisson structures, there's completely open. Um, and so the goal uh, that we had, uh, or that we have now for the final five minutes, is to explain how one can compute these numbers. And this is what I mean by a test for uh, our description of final tree falls. Um, the first description, due to Mori and Mukai, so this is from the 1980s. Um, it's a birational description. They really say, they classify the minimal final three folds, or I should say primitive final three folds, and then they say which ones are blow-ups of the others uh, in curves. Um, but this description is uh, not something you can tell a computer, and uh, not something useful to determine uh, Hochschild cohomology by hand. So this is not useful, but uh, there is a very interesting paper by uh, Coates, Corti, Galkin, and Kasprick uh, from 2013, where for completely unrelated reasons, not related to Hochschild cohomology, but related to uh, mirror symmetry and quantum cohomology, they gave a description of all final tree folds as a complete intersection in a toric variety. And I should say that up to six or seven cases. So for almost all elements in the classification, they gave a very concrete uh, description that you can really tell a computer, well, this is a final tree fault. Um, and they used this uh, very explicit description uh, in their work. Um, and very recently, uh, Debiase, I hope I didn't mispronounce that, Fatigenti and Tanturi, they gave uh, a description not using toric varieties and uh, intersections inside a toric variety, but they gave a description using weighted Grismanians, and now they're using equivariant vector bundles on these Grismanians. So this is an alternative description that you can really show to a computer. Uh, you can really encode everything in a good way, and you can start doing computations. And because we have 105 cases, it would be good if you don't have to do too many things by hand. Um, and so cases two and three, they are amenable to uh, computer algebra techniques um, because on toric varieties and on Grismanians, we can compute everything that we want. Uh, on toric varieties, this is just part of the general machinery for uh, toric vector bundles. And for Grismanians, we have this Borel-Wild-Bot uh, theorem. And so we have a sub-variety 
inside something in which we can compute everything. So we just combine uh, some causal uh, resolutions with these equivariant bundles. We have some toric bundles and some Borel wild bot uh, techniques. And this is something you can really tell to a computer. So if you feed um, classifications or descriptions from two and three into this machine, we know all the missing numbers, so we can determine the entire parallelogram that we set out to determine for all the 105 cases except for three that so far uh, don't work yet. Well, they will never work with the methods that we are using here. We need to find um, novel methods to compute these numbers. So this is what I mean by the good test for our understanding of final tree falls. Can we understand them well enough to compute interesting invariants? And the answer is, well, almost, but not yet. So there's only three minutes left. Um, so we're not going to be looking at all 105 examples. That would be a very boring slideshow. Um, I just want to give two conclusions, namely this, these numbers that we computed now uh, give us the number of moduli. So this really tells us in a given uh, element of the classification, how many are there really? Are there finitely many? Are there infinitely many? And if they're infinitely many, how can we parameterize all of them? Um, so this number of moduli for final tree faults is not known as far as I know. And so we can really compute it here as a virtual dimension. Um, there are other meanings you can assign to uh, the phrase number of moduli, and so we will discuss uh, these different uh, interpretations in the paper. And then there is this question about Poisson varieties, and so they were classified in rank one. And if you have a blow-up of a Poisson variety, and many of the final tree faults are indeed blow-ups uh, of smaller uh, final, vari final tree faults, then there exists a recipe of polystyrene to construct and even classify um, Poisson structures on the blow up by looking at Poisson structures uh, on the base, uh, which are compatible in a certain way with the center of the blow up. Um, and so we really just need to focus on those final tree faults, which are not primitive. And um, the classification, uh, so yeah, focus on this thing for classification. Of uh, final tree faults, or should say Poisson final tree faults. And there's uh, a short list of these, uh, because most are indeed blow ups, uh, but we get this vanishing for free uh, for at least three cases, for these three cases. Um, and so that is very good, uh, because this tells that there are definitely no Poisson structures. Um, and uh, for the other primitive cases, these global sections do not vanish. Uh, and so for the others, you need to understand this equation, this self bracket under the Schouten bracket uh, for a class. And uh, that we haven't done yet. Uh, so that would be an interesting question to do. Uh, but at least we know that there are some final tree falls which are definitely not possible. Um, and then the great majority of the other final tree falls, which are blow-ups, will have lots and lots of Poisson structures. Um, and I should end my talk with some uh, small advertisement. Uh, I have a website where I collect things which I find interesting about final tree falls and other people find interesting. And uh, very soon, maybe in a few days, I will uh, add uh, all this information, these dimensions that I just mentioned, uh, to this website so you can really look at all the 105 cases uh, and admire the numbers that we computed. And that's everything that I wanted to say. Thank you very much.